One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Welcome everybody. Today's Shadowcast is our breakdown of everything that we found in Episode 8, Alloyed, with a focus on all things evil. The season finale episode gave us most of the answers we were hoping for. Uh, we know for a fact now that the Istari have come to Middle-earth, and Sauron has finally been revealed. We also know that the Tolkien canon, uh, which has been pushed to the breaking point, has finally been shattered in this series, The Rings of Power. Um, I looked up the definition of alloy, and it means a substance composed of two or more metals intimately mixed. It can also have a second meaning, which is the mixing of good and evil. This seems like an appropriate title, after all, for this season finale of The Rings of Power. So, if you guys are ready, let's fire up the Forge of Eregion and discover all of its dark secrets. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. The final episode begins in Aaron Gollan, the deep forest of the Great Wood, which will one day be called Mirkwood. The stranger has entered its southern borders, but he is not alone. He awakens and remembers Nori's apple, which is wrapped in the star map. He recalls her words, You are not a peril. You are good. In that moment, he hears a twig snap and sees Nori, or thinks he does, but she runs away. He chases after her, dropping the apple down a hill. He finds Nori in a hidden veil. She is standing on the opposite slope, but she ducks under her cloak and then emerges as the dweller, a dramatic transformation showing the power of the Goth's dark sorcery. The other two cultists emerge from the trees. I have to say here that the folks at Amazon are definitely making use of the beautiful landscapes of New Zealand. The forests, the mountains, the trees, and the valleys. I hope that season two will not suffer because they moved the production to the UK. The three bow before the stranger and name him Lord Sauron. I remember thinking it's too soon to reveal Sauron in the finale episode. Next, we get our first look at the elven city of Eregion, as Galadriel and the wounded Halbrand ride toward the city. I want to interject here something about the use of maps. Maps have always been an integral part of Tolkien's world. I know that when I read both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings at the tender age of 10 and 11, which by the way was in the year 1969 and 1970, I would often pore over the maps and think about how it must have been to travel to those places. And I still do it when I'm reading Tolkien. I wish that they had used the maps more frequently in the show to give the audience a better sense of Middle Earth. I have to say that even on horseback, though, traveling from Mount Doom to Eregion in six days is quite a stretch. I really like the look of Eregion. It has a sort of Emerald City vibe, with green being the predominant color. We see Celebrimbor and Elrond lamenting their failure as Galadriel enters the city. I love the armor of the elves in Eregion. It's a better design than those of the elves in Linden. Halbran is whisked off to be healed, and Galadriel and Elrond share what has happened between them. We then witness the first meeting of Halbrand and Celebrimbor, 
which has an appropriate sense of foreboding, especially for those of us who know the fate of Celebrimbor. Halbrand befriends Celebrimbor by stroking his ego, and we begin to see more clearly that Halbrand is exhibiting all the deceptive traits of Sauron. We then travel to Numenor, to the Tower of Tar Palantir. Ferizan is saying the king is nearly dead, and they will raise the black flags at his passing. He calls for artisans from Numenor to draw the king to his likeness, so that he can be carved in stone, allowing him an immortality in death that no man may have in life. This is a key moment that sets the stage for Ferizan's rise to power and the downfall of Numenor. We turn to Eregion and see that King Gilgalad has arrived. He confronts Celebrimbor and Elrond about their failure to gain access to more of the Mithril. He has been told that one object could be forged to amplify the power of the Mithril to save the elves. There follows a great character moment when they each suggest a different object, revealing their natures. Elrond, the politician, suggests a scepter. Galadriel, the warrior, a sword. And Celebrimbor, in his vanity, suggests a crown. When Gilgalad discovers it is Halibrand who suggested the idea, he rejects it completely. In Halibrand's defense, Celebrimbor talks of seeking the power of the unseen world, and Galadriel turns to him, beginning to realize that the words of Halbrand must indeed come from Sauron in disguise. Elrond begs Gilgalad for more time, which he does grant. We then see Halbrand and Celebrimbor using the vast forge of Eregion. I have to say, everything about this forge is such a joy to watch. Its form and function were cleverly designed and feels very much a part of Middle-earth. I love the massive anvil. It makes me drool just thinking about how they will design Samoth Noir in the heart of Oradruin. Galadriel then calls on the assistance of an elven archivist to discover the truth about Halbrand. He says he must enter the catacombs to gather this information. Halbrand and Galadriel have an interesting exchange at this point. They acknowledge that each was saved by the other. Halbran, however, tells Galadriel that his debt is greater, that she raised him to heights that no one else could. He then leans in slyly, telling her that he will never forget it and he will see no one else does either. His words feel sinister and deceitful. In that moment, Galadriel knows in her heart that he is indeed Sauron. We then return to the Greenwood. The stranger is beset by the three Goths, who convince him that he is Sauron. They talk of a sign, and he pulls out the star map, and they show him the silver tray. The ascetic tells him this constellation is only visible in the far east, where the stars are strange. Another Tolkien reference. A quote, Aragorn says to Boromir at one point, I have crossed many mountains and many rivers, and trodden many plains, even into the far countries of Rhun and Harad, where the stars are strange. Nice. More Tolkien is always better. They tell the stranger of his power, and in this moment creates a swirling maelstrom Fearful his power will get out of control, the dweller puts him to sleep with a spell. They prepare to bind him when the Goths realize they are not alone. The Harfoots have come to rescue the stranger. Nori and Sadak untie the stranger, while Brandy and Marigold draw off the aesthetic and the nomad. 
Another spooky transition as we see the stranger is really the dweller in disguise. The true stranger lay unconscious in the woods. She tries to kill Nori and Sada grabs her, telling Nori to run. The nomad, who is the warrior in the group, wields a pair of mean-looking sickles. She throws one and it stabs Sadak in the chest. The stranger comes with all his power, but he is defeated by the staff of the dweller. The Harfoots try to run, but are nearly killed by the blades of the nomad. Just as she is about to kill Poppy, we see Sadak stab her in the foot, in a moment reminiscent of Meridoc Brandybuck's blow to the Witch King upon the fields of the Pelennor. The dweller, wielding her staff, spins the stranger in the air in much the same way that Saruman did to Gandalf in Orthanc. Marigold and Poppy throw stones, hitting the dweller, forcing her to the ground. She reaches into the fire and casts the flame of Udun from each hand, setting the entire veil on fire in an attempt to burn the Harfoots alive. Nori grabs the dweller's staff and gives it to the stranger. He tells her to go away or he will hurt her because he has been told who he really is. Nori looks down at him and tells him that only he can decide who he will be. She tells him that he is here to help. The stranger rises and the flames of Udun are extinguished. He has made his choice. He wields the staff, and the three Goths realize too late that he is not Sauron, but the other, the Istari. He strikes them with blazing white light, and they are revealed in their true form, reminiscent of the ring wraiths. Oddly, they turn to moths and fly away into the night. Something tells me we will see more of them in the next season. We then witness a beautiful scene of sorrow as Sadak dies from his wounds, surrounded by those he loves as the sun rises. We return to the ship, returning to Numenor. We see them enter the harbor, and the black flags are unfurled, signaling the death of the king. This sets the stage for Ferizan to become the last king of Numenor. We return to Eregion and see a massive explosion as they fail once again to mix the metals. It is Halbrand, of course, who suggests that they are trying to force the metals to meld rather than coaxing them into a union. Galadriel receives the information she has been waiting for. Halbran watches as she is given the scroll by the elven curator. We cut to Galadriel standing in a private patio by the waters of the Glanduin. The scroll hangs at her side. She has a stricken look on her face as she realizes what she has done. Halbran comes and tells her they are making not one object, but two. She confronts him about who he really is and asks him his true name. Halibrand says, I have been awake since the breaking of the first silence. In that time, I have had many names. His tone is filled with arrogance. He is Sauron, and Galadriel lunges at him with her knife. With confident ease, he fends off her attack. She is no match for his true power. What follows is a display of Sauron's power of deception. First, he tries to lure Galadriel by posing as her brother in Valinor. When that fails, he displays for the first time his depth of anger. He then transports them in her mind back to the raft on the ocean. When she refuses his offer to make her his queen, he unleashes his full rage. He makes Galadriel believe that she is drowning once more, and it is Elrond who pulls her from the water of the Glanduin. In fear, she threatens to kill him until he convinces her that he is indeed her friend. Sauron is nowhere to be found. 
Galadriel rushes back to Celebrimbor with a confused Elrond in pursuit. Elrond and Celebrimbor ask her what has happened. She will only tell them that Halibrand is gone and that he is no longer to be trusted. Celebrimbor asks if they should proceed, and Galadriel says that they must make three. One will always corrupt. Two will divide. But with three, there is balance. Celebrimbor tells Galadriel that he needs pure gold and silver of Valinor. She must give up the knife of her brother, Finrod. We cut back to the Harfoots and the stranger. There is a wonderful, heartfelt scene where Nori's parents pack her a bag and tell her that she must now follow the stranger. After a sorrowful goodbye to her family and her friend Poppy, she goes off with the stranger. She asks him, which way should they go? Always follow your nose, he says to her. I expect that's our final clue that he is indeed Gandalf. We watch as they set off on a great adventure. We return to Eregion and watch as the three elven rings are forged and their stones set. Narya, ring of fire, set with a fiery red ruby. Nenya, ring of water, adorned with a clear stone of adamant. And Vilya, ring of air, with a brilliant blue sapphire. They are all gorgeous. The scene is beautifully rendered and feels authentic. The smelting of Finrod's knife. Adding the mithril to the hot metals of Valinor. I love that they depicted the eye of Sauron after dropping in the mithril. The swirling mechanism used to alloy the liquid metals and the technique of pouring the hot metal into the molds that form the three billets. It was all wonderful. Finally, the intricate craft work of shaping the rings with heat. The gorgeous stones laid into place, all done to the musical score by Bear McCreary. Pure perfection. I loved all of it. As this scene unfolds, it is intercut with Elrond discovering the truth of Halibrand. Finally, the rings are laid out together on a stone table, and Elrond and Galadriel share a glance at one another with a look filled with complications. Celebrimbor looks upon his work with great pride and indeed vanity. As the camera pulls away from the rings, the image transforms into the eye of Halbrand, Anatar, Sauron, the dark lord of Mordor. The fires of Mount Doom are reflected in his iris. We then watch as Sauron descends into Mordor with a darkly beautiful Orodrun burning on the horizon. The episode ends with the words inscribed upon the One Ring of Power, this haunting rendition of the ring inscription is sung by Fiona Apple. So ends Season 1 of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Wow, what a finale. Beautiful, dark, and very satisfying, at least from my point of view. We ended up getting more than I anticipated in this episode. We discovered the identity of the stranger, who is, in fact, one of the Istari. Uh, we discover the identity of Halibrand, who has been revealed as Sauron. Um, and we, in addition to all that, we also got the forging of the three elven rings. At this juncture, I'm not ready yet to talk about the Tolkien canon and how it has been sort of mangled in this series. Um, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna save that for my uh, overall season one review. Uh, in conclusion, we saw most of the story threads come together in this savory finale. 
I cannot wait to see how they envision uh, Sauron forging the one ring of power in the fires of Mount Doom. If what we have seen thus far is any indication, it ought to be a visual feast for those of us who love Mordor. I am particularly interested in the first meeting of Adar and Sauron in the Land of Shadow, which should be coming almost immediately uh, in season two of The Rings of Power. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up today, uh, but stay tuned for my season one review, which is coming soon. So until next time, let's walk the dark byways under the shadow 